Let us pray. Gracious God, we, we come to you and we ask that we would, from our stories today, take something not only for our lives, but for the lives of those around us, that we might be a blessing to those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. I remember when I was getting near the end of my college career, I remember how for the first time in my life, maybe I lived in a bubble, but for the first time in my life, I started to feel the weight, the full weight of the decisions that I had to make and how they were falling on my shoulders. And for whatever reason, it wasn't until then that I started to focus on and to really to worry about, to worry about the big decisions I had to make and how they would impact the rest of my life. I started to put two and two together. The stakes seemed very high. This was one of the most stressful periods in my life and I think for many people's lives, in many people's lives. And so a crystal ball certainly would have been helpful. Robert Frost's classic American poem that we all studied as kids when we were young, and I'm hoping that kids today are still studying it, The Road Not Taken. By the way, Frost spoke here uh, at some point. I don't know the exact year, but he spoke from one of these pulpits. Frost's poem, The Road Not Taken, it captures something of that angst around decision-making. It begins like this. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry, I could not travel both, but be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one path as far as I could. Wouldn't it be nice to be able as Frost says, to be able to sort of sneak a peek and to see ahead down our possible paths that we're trying to decide between and to see how our decisions will work out. I was surprised to read just the other day, I'd never read this before, that Frost wrote this poem. He was trying to tease a friend of his who he walked a lot with who would often kind of complain that they'd picked the wrong path. Frost later wrote about the poem. He said, I'm never more serious than when I'm joking. The road not taken, despite a whimsical and even a teasing tone, it delves into a pocket near and dear to every human heart. How hard and how ambiguous life decisions can be, and how much we wish we could predict the right path and be assured of it, and how much we long for sort of clarity of direction and certainty. Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if you had one of those, you know, those, those, those magic eight balls, and you could pick it up anytime you had a tough decision, you just shake the thing and say, is this the right path? Yes, Al, it is decidedly so. Mm. I wish I had that. Listen to how Frost's great poem ends. Two roads diverged in the wood. Two roads diverged in the wood, and I took the one less traveled by, and that made all the difference. Now, many of us, especially if we are relatively new to the poem, we assume that Frost is saying that deciding to take the less traveled path, that that's the better way to go. But that's actually not what the poem says. Yes, it says that the less traveled path, it made all the difference, but it does not say whether that's a good difference or a bad difference. In this way, I think Frost 
kind of leaves us hanging without precise guidance for our decision making. And instead, he's leaving us with this sort of basic truth. The decision making is important and that it's challenging and outcomes, however, are unpredictable, which makes our decisions both daunting, but also exciting. And thankfully, God has given us the freedom to make our own decisions, daunting and exciting though they may be. We encounter today in our two readings, two of the boldest decision makers maybe in human history, Abraham and Peter, and Sarah too. But the primary characters are Abraham and, and Peter in, these, in this particular story. Bold decision makers. And we encounter them after, long after having made these decisions, at precarious moments in their journeys. They both had earlier decided to drop everything to follow God. Abraham followed God's promise to be a great nation, a great people, miraculously to be spawned through his wife, his elderly wife, Sarah. And then Peter, a fisherman, in response to Jesus' call to go come with him and be a fisher of people, he drops everything to follow, to follow Jesus. We actually never get insight into how they make their decisions. We only know that they trusted God enough to make their bold decisions. Today, however, they both come to kind of a fork in the road one of many forks in the road that they would each encounter on their journeys of faith. Journeys, both of their journeys, which were anything but sort of uneventful walks in the park. Very up and down. When any of us make a decision, especially a decision we're stressed over and especially one that seems especially bold. I think it's safe to say that we all would like, after we've made that decision and we're on the journey, we'd like a little reassurance along the way. You know, a little evidence to let us know that we're still on the right path. Well, that's what Abraham longed for. He longed for it throughout his journey. And there was tension between Abraham and God. And so today, it's 24 years later, and still no baby, and now Sarah is 90 years old. The whole thing was starting to look like a maybe a failed initiative. And so what does God do to reassure him? God simply reiterates the promise. Yes, your wife is going to get pregnant, and, and you and she will spawn a great people. In Abraham's reaction, first he, he, he falls down face first, and it sounds like a, an act of faith, and, it, and it, 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 it may well have been. But the next thing you know, he's doubling over in laughter, basically saying, yeah, right, a 90-year-old year old woman is going to have a baby. Truthfully, Abraham's laughter, it's obvious, it makes sense, and yet, Maybe Abraham's greatest act of faith was that despite his pretty sarcastic laughter, he continues the journey with God. In our reading from Mark, Peter is now, it's two years roughly, two years after he would met Jesus and, and, and decided to go with him. And so they knew each other pretty well. But today, Jesus actually shocks Peter with some new information. He tells them and the disciples that Jesus says, I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die. I will be resurrected. Peter does not find this to be funny at all. Instead, he rebukes Jesus, which again, I think makes sense. He's basically saying, now let me get this straight. I dropped everything to follow you and you're going to die on me? It seems possible 
very possible that Peter could have easily at that moment given up and gone home. But he doesn't. Somehow he finds the trust to go on, even though Jesus continues and very bluntly tells him, the disciples, about the hard times that are ahead and how much courage is going to be needed. And even though Jesus also turns out not to be the kind of Messiah that Peter and everybody else expected, a warrior Messiah. Instead, Jesus turns out to be a Messiah who comes in peace, pointing us towards love and eternity, not anger and retribution. And that was not what was expected by anyone. Thank God Peter decided to keep going, and thank God Abraham decided the same. But also, thankfully, thankfully, God decided not to give up on either of them despite the laughter and despite the re rebuke. And because of that, how comforting it is that God doesn't force these two men or us to be automatons and to march and to just simply march in lockstep when God says march. And how freeing it is that God gives these two men and us room to question and to doubt and to make our own decisions, even if those decisions might be to change paths. In neither story do we see coercion from God from Jesus, no coercion. In fact, Jesus reads them. He goes so far as to read them, the fine print, which is pretty, well, it might easily have scared Peter off. You know, pick up your cross and follow me. Everyone knew what the cross was in those days. There was no manipulation here. Instead, we see a promise to, from, from, from God to walk with us through the ups and downs. We also see a God who is longing for us to choose to walk with God on whatever path we might pick. I see flexibility here, not rigidity. I see a desire from God to connect with us wherever we might be and wherever we might go. Thinking back to Robert Frost, I think in a way he does leave us in, in, in it seems pretty intentional. He leaves us hanging. He leaves us hanging with a reality. The reality that there are many paths we can take in life and that those decisions, when we've made them, they will make a difference. Fox tells us that that's a fact of life. Frost gets the stress in those decisions. And he's saying that it's just how life is with all its potential for ups and downs and for good decisions and bad decisions. But when we look at these stories, and especially when we look at the breadth of Peter and Abraham's life, Scripture, these stories add something vital to what Frost is so beautifully telling us. And that is that no matter what decisions we make, and even if we change decisions midstream, God wants us, we're supposed to, we're being encouraged to make those decisions with God and then to walk them with God. A God who so badly wants to be part of our journeys. And because of that, our decisions they actually can be made with less stress and less panic and less worry when we trust that God is going to be walking with us on any path. And so in closing, I'd like to return to or go to another great American with a unique voice, with a unique way of speaking, Yogi Berra. 
Yogi said, maybe his most famous words, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. Friends, that's great wisdom. Because when we come to forks in the road, when we come and we have to make decisions in our lives, especially big ones and decisions that are stressful and hard to make, when we trust that God is going to be with us in the decision and in the aftermath of the decision, whichever path we go down, God is going to be with us. Whichever one we go on, God is with us. In fact, Wherever we choose to go, God is already there waiting to be with us. Amen.